You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back for episode number three of Angry Marks Rewind here on the Angry Marks Podcast Network, your number one source for pro wrestling and mixed martial arts news and information. This week, I have a special guest host. Our regular host, Ryan Joseph, has been on assignment because he is buying a house. So he will be back after he gets finished doing all of his grown-up things. Uh, we have a wonderful co-host this week stepping in. You know her from the NXT reports. She's a retired veteran of the Angry Marks Podcast Network, Aria Whitner. Welcome. How, how are you today? I am great, thank you. How are you? I'm doing really good. Sorry for the... We had. It uh, seems we always have technical issues here before we yep. begin. But, uh, hey, no, we're not, uh, we're not perfect. No, but hey, it's all good. So, uh, we are going to be talking about the 1998 edition of WWF Fully Loaded. Of course, you can find it on your WWE network. Uh, before we begin, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to just share a, an experience that I had today, actually. Where I work, it's kind of a, it's like a, like a, a cubicle jungle. I sit in an office all day. The dress code as such is business casual. So, but, they have have lightened the dress code, and as such, I was I was excited to wear the one piece of wrestling merchandise that I have, which is a Bullet Club shirt. And I did not, I didn't technically buy it from the Young Bucks, so if they hear about this, I'm kind of taking money out of their pocket. It's okay, they blocked me on Twitter, so you know, I don't care anyway. <laughs> uh, I, I I think most of us as wrestling fans, we we do we do take pride in our wrestling merch. And it's one of those things where we, you know, we like to wear it, but we're sort, if you're like me, kind of have this fear of wearing it outside the house for fear of what people will say. We, we, everyone who's a wrestling fan still has those family members that ask us, uh, you know, it's fake, right? It's not real. So for the first time yesterday, I wore my Bullet Club shirt to work. I'm walking around the office, I'm walking to the bus stop. I want people to notice what I'm wearing. Does that make sense? But at the same time, you don't want anyone to know. Kind of. You know, I, w- I want to take pride in what I'm wearing. And like I said, at the same time, I, I want people to sort of know that what I'm wearing is is cool in 2018. Hopefully it's hopefully it's cool. The last other piece of wrestling merch I ever wore in public was a 1994 Made in the USA Lex Luger hat. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> so I guess, like... The point of this story is there's there's this guy at my work who I don't know. Uh, we pass each other in front of the photocopier all the time. He is a very large gentleman. Uh, he's very built. He has the Jersey Shore hair. He he doesn't seem like the kind of guy that I would normally hang out with. And like I say all these things out of sheer jealousy because I don't have a physique. I'm not young. I'm not tanned. I'm not six foot five. This gentleman is. And before I would have just judged him. Based on his kind of douchey appearance, he saw me, he has looked at my shirt, he said, cool threads, dude, and he threw up the two sweet. So now, hey. me and douchey photocopier guy, we have a connection. And isn't that really what being a pro wrestling fan is all about? See, I was hoping he was going to wear like a Robbie E. t-shirt or something. You two were going to bond that way, but hey, that was pretty cool too. Okay, if you live in like, I don't know, a major, I don't know, pick a major city, New York. If you live in New York and you're wearing a New York Giants shirt and you see another guy wearing a New York Giants shirt, that's not a big deal. Like, there isn't that same sort of connection. If you're wearing a wrestling shirt and you see someone else walking down the street approaching you also wearing a wrestling shirt, you already have this sort of kinship, you know? You sort of, you've built this relationship with this person that words don't, words are not required. So that makes me feel all special and warm and fuzzy inside. So, When I was in New Orleans at WrestleMania 30, I'm so used to being the only person wearing a wrestling shirt that I got there the first day, like a Wednesday before, and I'm walking around, and the first person I see wearing a wrestling shirt, I marked out because I'm like, oh, my God, someone else is wearing a wrestling shirt. And then I suddenly realized, hey, dumbass, WrestleMania is four days away. You're going to see plenty of people wearing wrestling shirts. And it's not, it's shockingly, not, it is. It's not going to be a novelty at that point. No, it really isn't. 
Uh, my son has a, uh, a Young Bucks shirt. It's his favorite shirt. He's had it for about three years now. And he saw another guy in Walmart wearing another Young Bucks shirt. And he kind of had this feeling like he wants to just sort of approach him and say, you know, I believe, brother. And he walked up to the guy and he said, hey, nice shirt. Look, I got one too. And the guy looks at him and says, it's just a shirt, man. So when when you when you hit home runs fifty percent of the time you're going to strike out the other fifty percent. Yep. I somebody at, in my town has a bullet club hoodie that they obviously got from Hot Topic and does not know who they are because the first time I saw them I went and did the two sweet thing and they looked at me as if I had three heads. Now it's possible that you know I'm just enough of a dork that they looked at me that way anyway. But I really got the feeling that they had no idea who the Bullet Club really were, and I'm just some schmuck doing a goofy hand sign at them. One of the supervisors at my work, uh, she ha- she was fearful that I was some part of some sort of uh, gun NRA type organiz- <laughs> organization. But that's what being a wrestling fan in 2018 is. However, we are getting back and we are going to go back into the wayback machine. 20 years ago last month, that was really the reason why we picked this show to do. It wasn't for anything in particular. I just, I was asking Ryan, what should we do? And we kind of hummed and hawed. We saw, what happened 20 years ago on in this month? So, Aria, what were you doing 20 years ago in June? Oh, or, uh, the- July, sorry. Oh, yeah. I was 13 years old. I used to record Raw every single week on my VCR. I did not watch this pay-per-view at the time, but I... Do, I, I saw it like once or twice before the network came out, and I remember not really caring for it then, and oh boy, did it age just as well as I remember. This was the first time I had seen this show in prob well, probably since it came out. We uh, Despite living in a small rural town, our video store was really good at bringing in wrestling videos for, uh, you know, there was like my, me and my group of friends, and they were very... Uh, they were consistently bringing in uh, WWF videos, and this was one of them. And if you uh, if you Google this this uh, event, basically all you're going to see is is Sable, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, this turned out to be a, a rather inconsequential pay per view in the long run because it really wasn't building up the SummerSlam main event the following month. We had just come off the Hell in the Cell with Taker and Mankind. And this was just kind of slotted right in the middle here. Yep. Um, actually, it was a pretty successful show. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that uh, when we finish up. But the show did a much better buy rate than I think a lot of people were expecting. And I think it goes to show that Sable, of all people, at least temporarily, was a draw. And, you know, for the people who are scoffing at their computers right now, I do have data to back up that claim that I'll share later on. Okay, so it's July 26, 1998 from Fresno, California at the Cylinder Arena. Uh, we start the show immediately. The show begins with Jerry Lawler in Sable's dressing room and she is just teasing him like, like, and he is marking out like he had never seen boobs before. Well, have you seen Miss Kitty? She, you know, was not very well endowed up top. So, so this, this was a treat for, uh, for young Jerry. Yes, yes. So she gives him uh, a sneak peek of what she'll be wearing, and Jerry Lawler is, he's the only guy that can be Jerry Lawler. I think he had his first heart attack uh, when he saw what the sneak peek. We go out to the arena, our hosts are Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, as is, as is uh, the usual. We get Val Venus versus Jeff Jarrett to open the show. Um, actually, was there, a dark, was there a dark match on this show? I didn't even see that. Um, I... I honestly didn't look it up, but I don't think so. Okay. If we do, it, it, it eh, doesn't matter. It, yeah. People are going to be yelling, you tell me about this dark match right now. <laughs> These poor people. So we have Val Venus and Jeff Jarrett. Accompanying Jeff Jarrett is Tennessee Lee and the repackaged Godwins, who are now called Southern Justice. I'm- um, yeah, I remember kind of looking forward to seeing what they were going to do. It's unfortunate that Henry Godwin... I think he had a neck injury that basically retired him a few months later. Um, and other than a brief comeback, you know, a decade later, he's never seen again, at least in the ring. Mm-hmm. 
So the story going into this is that Val Venus is having relations with the wife of Mr. Yamaguchi-san, who is uh, Wally Yamaguchi, who uh, oh, we're, we're, we're blessed to have him at the announce table. Oh, yes. I And I'm pretty sure he went to the... Uh, uh, Oh, who's that? Sun- who's that guy that used to run uh, my boy? Sonny. Oh, um. Oh, um, oh and- God. Um. People Jimmy Cornette s- is screaming at us right now. <laughs> um, I was going to say Sonny Ono, but you, you went a different direction. Um. Jim, Jim Barnett. Barnett. There we go. <laughs> Jinx. So uh, <laughs> he went to the Jim. Edit. <laughs> he went to the Jim Barnett School of Broadcasting, and he just kind of said, "Well, you know." You know how it is. You know what we're gonna do. You know how it is. My boy. We're, uh, Val comes out and he is, uh, he's telling everyone that the big Val Boski is, I, I, I didn't write it down word for word, but he does his, exactly what you would expect a big, big Val Boski opening promo to be. And he's the undefeated Val Venus. Yeah, he'd only been, he'd only debuted a few months before. So, uh, we get Yamaguchi son out there. He's wearing the, the Hideo Nomo. Yeah, that was his guy, right? The guy yeah. for the Dodgers wearing the Hideo Nomo hat. Uh, we're just supposed to ignore his broken English for now. Jarrett trips up Val, starts to walk over him to start, does the Fargo strut. Venus does the same thing back to Jarrett, starts grinding on him, right, uh, starts like standing over him doing the Rick Rude uh, hip swivel. Uh, Yamaguchi san says, Val, there's gonna be a very big surprise for him tomorrow night, you know, on the Raw show, you know? <laughs> He's gonna choppy choppy Val Venus's PP. How many weeks away were we from that? Because I know that that didn't happen the next week. No, it couldn't have been long, though, because they... This is one of those, I'm too much of a dork, so I remember all these things. Val and Taka team up to wrestle Kai and Tai, and then Taka turns on Val, because Taka is Yamaguchi-san's wife's sister. Right, they're brother-in-laws. Yes. And then they kidnap Val Venus... And then chop, try to choppy choppy him. John Wayne Bobbitt stops it. And then the following week, Val has a gauntlet match against all four and loses in the end. Don't ask me why I remember all of that. You didn't have you didn't have to do any research on that. You, no, because <laughs> I wouldn't have remembered that at all, except you know the the end result. I, I do not know why I remember that. So uh, Jarrett sends him to the floor. There's some managerial interference. Tennessee Lee was not nearly as over as he was in WCW. Uh, for those that don't know, Tennessee Lee was Robert Fuller. He, uh, him and his brother ran uh, was uh, Continental Wrestling in the South mm-hmm. for for quite a long time. Uh, pretty uh, pretty successful, and he was brought in here basically as nothing more than just a uh, either a mouthpiece for Jarrett. Uh, he didn't have a backstage job. Like he. Most of these legendary managers that they brought in, like your J.J. Dillons, they would have other jobs backstage, but Tennessee Lee was just purely talent. And I don't know if you want to say it was wasted, but, I mean, this was the Attitude Era. They were getting rid of managers. They got rid of Cornette. Paul Bearer was, I don't know, Paul Bearer, they refused to get rid of him, which, for good reasons, he was basically the only manager that stuck around after a while. And, uh... You know, Paul Ellering was in and out that we'll get to, and Tennessee Lee. Tennessee Lee only lasted, I think, like seven months, maybe eight. And if it was, if he was going to be paired with anyone, why would they put him with Jarrett, who can, who already knew how to cut a pretty decent promo? Your guess is as good as mine. It was they paired him with Jarrett when the NWA Jeff Jarrett traditional guy didn't work out, and then they decided to. Buzz Jeff Jarrett's head and, you know, give him an attitude. And so they had to dump Tennessee Lee then. But it's just, this is a weird middle area that most people don't remember, choose not to remember. So, uh, Jarrett blocks an exploder suplex and he uh, hits a DDT. We're going to see about 90 DDTs on this show here. Uh, Venus scores with an atomic drop and a clothesline. Fisherman suplex for a two. Jared avoids the corner charge, delivers a flying body press for two. Val comes back with a power slam. He starts to head up when the referee gets elbowed in the eyeball. Tim White's checking to see if he still has an eyeball, and Tennessee Lee trips Val on the top rope. 
we can see Val now. He's got a, a, a pretty big gash under his eye. He starts leaking blood pretty profusely. Uh, Jarrett brings Venus down with a superplex. He tries a figure four, but Val blocks with an inside cradle for a two. That brings Tennessee Lee up on the apron. He gets knocked down. Venus hits an O'Connor roll, and he gets the win at seven minutes and 51 seconds. But it seemed like the whole background of this, as you mentioned, was... Um, to bring up the choppy, choppy stuff, because there was no story as to why these two were wrestling. Um, and Val Venus implied that Yamaguchi-san had a very small wang, and it led to my favorite line in this match, where Yamaguchi-san said that Americans are obsessed with size, and referenced the Titanic, which is a ship that was built in England. <laughs> See, I didn't catch that. There's some trivia for you buffs there. Uh, it, it's kind of a disappointment because I think like the commentary certainly took away from what was, outside of that, you know, a pretty good opener. I thought the crowd was pretty hot for this, and uh, the storyline of Yamaguchi really took something away. And I would have liked to see these two guys, you know, feud for the better part of uh, better part of the summer. I think this was the first of a few matches in the show that should have been a lot better than they were. Up next, we have D'Lo Brown, the newly crowned, the prestigious European champion who had won the title from Triple H the previous Monday on Raw with the help from The Rock. He's taking on X-Pac in a match that wins my award for two guys with the dopest music on the entire show. Uh, I absolutely loved uh, 98-era nation music. I want to play that in my car, and... <laughs> I've always thought Xbox music was really cool. Any any remix version of the DX theme, the Mike Tyson version, I always thought that was really cool. And that's another one of those things, you know, I would purposely play that in my car with the windows rolled down. In and, 2018, Mike. At, in 2018. And I am looking at, you know, the young ladies walking on the sidewalk. They hear my music, and <laughs> I, I give them the finger point, and they... I was going to say, I want to believe that you pick up women while playing D'Lo Brown's Nation theme. <laughs> hey, baby, I got the whole CD. I got uh, Steve Blackman's music. You know? Oh my! <laughs> to change the subject briefly, one of the WrestleManias I was at with my brother and our friend Guy, and he was driving, and he had the one of the WWF entrance music CDs on in his car, and it had the Sexual Chuck and Mark Henry theme. <laughs> and it kept skipping the, for the first eight seconds of that song. So over and over, we just heard, it's sexual, baby. Oh, <laughs> we're going to get you all. And it, it was one of those things, it was funny, it was funny, then it stopped being funny, and then it kept happening, so it just became hilarious. And, you know, yeah. And then after a while, it just became sad and embarrassing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, so they tell us that this match was scheduled to be uh, a European title match, but D'Lo refused. And I thought, well, he only won the belt six days ago. When they signed the match, this wasn't going to be a title match. See, I, so, don't think, I don't think they were saying it was supposed to be a title match. I think they just said D'Lo refused to defend the title. What a dick. Well, I mean, who knows if that could work today, like, Maybe that's why Brock only defends the title once every six months. He just refuses to defend it any other amount of time, and Kurt doesn't care enough to force him to. You just compared D'Lo Brown to Brock Lesnar. Yes, I did. <laughs> hey, they almost have the same number of wins in 2018. That's true. I was shocked to learn that D'Lo Brown worked last weekend. See, I just went on WWE television, but... D'Lo might have more wins than Brock. Who knows? He worked a Black Label Pro event last week. I was shocked. Uh, um, well, Nikolai Volkov, God rest his soul, was still wrestling a few months ago. I saw him wrestling like five years ago, so I guess I'm not terribly surprised that D'Lo is still out there. Although, one thing I love about D'Lo, besides the head bob, and you made a good point on Facebook saying that WWF dropped the ball by not creating the D'Lo Brown bobblehead. It, it took TNA to do that. So, of all people. So we'll chalk one up to them. Nobody enjoyed being the European champion more than D'Lo. Oh, no. I, every, I, oppor every opportunity he got, he was he was flashing that belt in front of the screen, 
uh, declaring how he was the champion, and he did that multiple times throughout this show. Except maybe Mr. Regal, but it seemed more of a sense of pride that he's the champion of Europe than Vila, who was just flat out excited to be the champion. Okay, so what do we have here? So uh, Xbox starts, uh, he controls the match pretty, it's a pretty fast-paced match, starting with lots of arm drags and kicks and exactly, you know, what, you, what you've come to expect from an X-Pac match. Uh, D'Lo comes back with a couple spinning wheel kicks for his own. X-Pac misses a charge in the corner. Uh, he gets stuck in a chin lock. D'Lo, by the way, missed the moonsault at one point that probably would have missed even if X-Pac didn't move. Like, yeah, yeah, he missed that by at least three feet. X-Pac could have uh, got a lawn chair and recliner and just relaxed and had a drink and not moved, and D'Lo would have missed. Yeah. Now, we get to the finish. Why did China jump on the ring apron? Because she jumped up on the ring apron while X-Pac was in control, and then the Godfather jumped up on the ring apron to interfere after China distracted the referee. Yeah, D'Lo goes to whip X-Pac into the ropes. Uh, the referee is tied up with China, so Godfather sneaks in, and we should also mention, this is probably the first mention of him being referred to just as the godfather of the nation. Mm-hmm. So a lot of guys in the nation are starting to sort of morph into, you know, the characters that we would sort of be more familiar with down the road. Godfather hits the uh, forearm to Xbox, uh, the back of his head. Xbox returns the favor, knocks him down to the floor. And just as he turns around, he gets hit with the sky high for the win at 8 minutes and 29 seconds. Good match, like with the first match, you know, expected a lot more. And actually, these two would have several much better matches in the months to come. Yeah, they didn't really knock it out of the park here, but I thought it was okay considering that this was the beginning of Dilo's single push. Mm-hmm. So and, I, and unless I'm mistaken, it's actually Dilo's first singles pay-per-view match. Like, he's had six mans other 8- and 10-man teams with the nation, but I believe this was his first singles match. Uh, Backstage, we get Kevin Kelly, accompanied by his goatee, and Dr. Tom Pritchard, who's wearing a purple shirt that looks like it should be, I don't know, the pattern of some carpet somewhere. (laughs) So they're standing out by the the WWF.com desk, and basically saying that The Undertaker has not shown up to the building yet, and Pritchard believes that The, ta- that, uh, the Taker won't let his fans down. He's going to be there. They did say this was disturbing news. But, but don't they realize this is the Attitude Era, and wrestlers regularly show up hours into the show? Hell, at WrestleMania 17, The Rock didn't even show up until like four or five matches had already happened. So there's no 2 p.m bell call for these guys now, eh? Apparently not, no. That takes us to a interesting tag match. We got Farouk and his tag partner Scorpio versus the team of Bradshaw and Terry Funk. And the match starts with an interview backstage. Terry Funk is talking to Jim Ross and Funk tells the world that this is going to be my last match for at least six months. You had egg-sucking dog. That was terrible. Yeah, but wait till you hear my stew impression. Uh, Bradshaw seems pretty pissed because this is this is the first time he's hearing about this. He's hearing about it with you know like the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Match starts. Bradshaw's bullying Scorpio around to start. Uh, he's c- uh, clearly channeling Stan Hansen. We get an APA showdown. Bradshaw and Farouk start hammering each other with shoulder blocks. There's a tag to Funk. He starts punching Farouk down. He follows up with a reverse neckbreaker. Farouk rallies with a backbreaker for a two. and He start, he looks for the Dominator, but Bradshaw boots him down. Uh, about halfway through, we see... Uh, we got Scorpio and Terry Funk in the ring. Scorpio hits this insanely long-distance second leg... Or second rope leg drop on Funk. I thought he was going to bust his ass. Yeah, he he's always done that move, the... One and a half gainer, but like this time, like he'd been gaining weight over the years, and I was kind of shocked he got all the way over. To be honest with you, yeah. Uh, on the outside, we have uh, Funk kind of getting the heat on Scorpio. He does what I thought he was going to do, like 
a moonsault to the outside, like Ultimo Dragon, but he just ends up doing, like, jumping on the second rope and doing, like, a Vader bomb on the outside. He might as well. No one else did that move in this, in this show. Scorpio delivers a flying splash for a two count. He hits, uh, oh yeah, he hits that big leg drop. Uh, the crowd's letting us know that at this point they're getting pretty bored. The match breaks down. The, uh, the acolytes start fighting each other on the floor. And during the melee on the outside, Scorpio hits the safest looking 450 splash on Terry Funk that you'd ever see for the win. This match only went six minutes and 52 seconds. And the, the, the real star of the show was, of, or of this match was Bradshaw after the match. He basically, you know, took all of his frustrations out on Terry, on poor old Terry. Yes, he did. But I'll tell you what, this was the first match that the, you know, it lived up to the height. However, you know, the bar was so low, it was almost impossible for him to not, to get over that bar, but hey, one out of three. So he's, he's beaten up on Terry Funk and Scorpio and, and Farouk come back in. Of course, you know, Scorpio's gonna save him, cause he's family, you know? Terry mm-hmm. Funk, Flash Funk, they're, they're, they're cousins. They're kin. Yeah. Bradshaw, they Bradshaw just nailed Farouk with a really stiff chair shot to the back. Clothesline Scorpio, he does a big, uh, three, big 360 flip. That looked really impressive for someone his size. By the way, you know, Flash and Terry met at their mutual cousin Jimmy Jack's, uh, barbecue. <laughs> And, and, and their, their uncle Haas? Yes, he, he was there too, you know. Speaking of good God, up next, Vader and the ultra green Mark Henry. <laughs> oh lord, the story of Mark Henry is truly astounding. I mean, this guy gets signed to a 10 year contract in 1996, and for nine years, both sides admit that this was a bad idea. But Mark was not going to give up no matter what they did, no matter what they did to him, how they booked him. He was not going to quit and he was going to collect his money for 10 years. And then suddenly, in 2006, in year number 10, the WWE decides, let's try to get some money out of this and make him this monster heel. And then he proceeds to re-sign for another 10 years, wins the world title, and goes into the Hall of Fame. See, if you're watching this in 98 and you're thinking, out of these two guys, one of them is going to be a Hall of Famer. So you're obviously thinking, you know, it's the multiple-time WCW World and U.S. Champion. But but no, you're right. You know, They tried everything to get this guy to quit. He was... He played it so smart, and he just started... He was just collecting the money. And throughout this, throughout his whole career, at least early on, there were a lot of guys that were really pissed off at this guy because he was getting this awesome deal. They were paying him to train in OVW. They were paying him, uh, this ungodly salary for someone with his experience level. Oh yeah. And, uh, it, it all just, like, at the end of the day, you know, in a way he earned it that Hall of Fame thing because if for nothing else, then he, was they tried to embarrass him. They made him get a blowjob from a transvestite. They had him sleep with an 80-year-old woman. I don't know. It's hard to imagine that they that this relationship would have lasted 20 years and counting. And now he's probably one of their top ambassadors. And you're probably going to see him in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal next year at Mania. You'll see him in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Every year until Mark Henry probably passes away. Him, Big Show, and Kane, the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, will always be in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Mm-hmm. So this match starts very ominously, and the agents are probably wondering within the first minute what they were getting into when they signed Henry, because he botched a body slam. Oh, and yeah. He dropped poor Vader right on his fucking head, neck. I thought... This poor guy was going to have major neck and shoulder issues, and Vader bailed immediately. He knew he was pissed. He could he knew that that poor Mark had screwed up early, and it didn't get any better from there. Actually, after they screwed up the body slam, Mark Henry does a sunset flip and gets all the way over. How he? How long would he have have had to practice that? 
I don't know. But yeah, he gets a sunset flip on Vader, and Vader just squished him with his big ass. Now, I did get annoyed with one thing, and this is Jim Ross more than anything else. Vader hits a middle rope splash, a move that it's not a one of his regular moves, but he's used quite a bit over the years. He has never won a match with this move. Or if he has, it is so infrequently that nobody could sit and Nate tell me five times he's won a match with a middle rope splash. As soon as Mark Henry kicks out, JR screams at the top of his lungs that no one has ever kicked out of, of Vader's middle rope splash. That's Bullshit. because he, he's never tried to pin anyone with a middle rope splash. There you go. That, that makes as much sense as anything else. So Vader takes him over to the corner. He starts giving him his signature stiff punches. An avalanche sets up a short arm clothesline, which looked like it fucking sucked. Henry gets tossed into the floor. He goes for a ride into the steps. Uh, They throw each other back in. Vader splashes him from that second rope for a two. Henry then hits a power slam. And not, and then just hits a regular splash. Not a second rope splash. Not a superfly splash. Just a regular running Splash for the win at 5.04, out of nowhere. I've forgotten that that was his finisher for a while. And it's like, it wasn't even like he ran and then did the splash. It just kind of stood there and jumped up a little bit in the air and landed on Vader. And, you know, Vader, a year later, was in All Japan, winning the Triple Crown title and getting career resurrection, which, almost like Mark Henry... Very few people saw that coming at the time. So we get back to, we're, we're back at the WWF.com desk. There's still no word that Undertaker is in the building or not. And it's at this point that we hear Kane's music in the arena. Now, Kevin Kelly and Tom Pritchard, by the way, said that people are searching the entire city of Fresno for the Undertaker. I want to think they're knocking on people's houses and holding up pictures of Undertaker and saying, have you seen this man? And... You know, I, I didn't think they had enough time to do all that, but, you know, it must have worked. Spoiler. Yeah. That would have been a great series of vignettes leading up to the show. Just have Taker no-show Raw for a couple weeks, and then have the crew going out, scoping out Starbucks, looking at Kinko's. Uh, have you seen this man? Have you seen, the, have you seen this dead man? So we get Kane and Mankind coming out, along with Paul Bearer. And basically, they're telling. It's at this point they tell the crowd that Undertaker hasn't shown up yet, and so there's some uh, there's some wonder whether or not he is going to stick by Stone Cold's side and be his tag partner for this. And the, uh, out of nowhere come not the, Stone Cold, but the New Age Outlaws. Well, and you know, Kane did, and Mankind are 13 days into their epic WWF tag team title reign. They. Yeah, they beat the Outlaws a couple weeks ago, didn't they? Indeed. Okay. So here's the booking. They they say that oh, well, the Outlaws come out, and they start to demand a title shot tomorrow on Raw, which kind of teases the fact that maybe Kane and Mankind are going to retain. So take a look at these five guys in the ring. 20 years from now, if I were to tell you, one of them is going to be a mayor of a city, one of them is going to be prob- you know, probably one of the number one creative guys on SmackDown. And I wouldn't have picked Road Dogg, and I sure as hell wouldn't have picked Kane. I don't know who I would have picked for that first one. Um, maybe Road Dogg for that? I don't know. I would thought for sure maybe Foley could have been, you know, a SmackDown agent. Or well. even Paul, even Paul Bearer. But... The two guys that I thought were the least likely to have those jobs are the ones that ended up with them. See, I would have liked to go back in time to 1998 and hear you tell me that uh, Road Dog is going to be the lead writer on SmackDown. Because I would have turned to you and said, "What the hell is SmackDown?" Well, that's right, because it wouldn't have even it, it wouldn't have uh, debuted yet. We would have had to burn you at a stake. Uh, so there's a brawl. They get pulled apart by, you know, the goof troop, the goons. And Tony Gurria, five-time WF Tag Team Champion. There's a lot of legends in that group. Sorry, you, you get the Sarge. He's the I'm, commissioner, uh, damn it. I'm going to make my wife watch uh, the uh, the 91 Rumble with Sarge and Warrior. 
I want to I want to get her opinion on this. Well, I mean, Savage and Sherry make that entire match. Yeah, we're gonna have to uh, probably check that one out somewhere down the road. And then it's fucking tight oh, match. God. By the way, Dave Meltzer uh, said that this wasn't bad. I mean, it was bad, but like he gave it. He was complimentary towards this match. Our co-host Ryan and I had a had a bit of a beef this week on uh, on Facebook about different podcasts to listen to, and uh, I guess he is maybe it's because I've been listening to Dave for fifteen years. Ryan had the nerve and the audacity and the temerity to say. Hey, have you checked out Bischoff's podcast? It's so much better. I hate Meltzer. I didn't know what to say. I, I, want, I, I wanted him drawn and quartered. I tried to watch uh, one of the Bruce Pritchard WWE Network podcasts. It was the one about AJ Styles and TNA. And okay. I got so freaking annoying. They, it was an hour-long show, I think, and they spent half of it ripping on Dave, and the other half using Dave as a source to further along the story. And I'm like, fine, if you think Dave's full of shit, go right ahead. It's your opinion. However, if you think the guy's full of shit, don't use, don't use him as your source to relay what's going on at the time and relaying the news. Right, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna bury Dave, why not talk about the 90% of the time that he's right? Yeah. But when it came to this match, sorry, brother, hit you, you uh, swing and a miss on this one. We got LOD 2000. Anytime you have anything 2000, it sucks, except Techno Team 2000. Oh, of course, Eric Watson, Chad Fortune. And, I mean, come on, that's a quality team right there. They came to a house show in Winnipeg in 1997, and my buddy Keith and I had a sign uh, that we displayed proudly saying this is Techno Team 2000 Country. And because of that, uh, the headbangers saw that and we popped them. So that made me feel pretty good. So when you said they came for our show in 1987, they were going to say Techno Team 2000 game. I'm like, how weak was that card on paper that they brought those two back like that? Oh god, no. I know. They were, they had probably been, you know, fired the year prior. Oh, they, I, Aren't they like 95 or were they 96? I guess it doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, I seem to think they're more summer of 95. Although they may have been with Who and Alex Porto and all, all those all time great. <laughs> oh, I remember the Pug. The Pug versus Mantar. I want to see that. Uh, that's a Wrestle Crap main event anywhere in the country. You told me about your dismay for the Harris Twins. The why fucking so, Harris Twins. Why, why so much salt for Ron and Don? Okay. I, now, part of this is my fault. For a little while, a few years ago, I was re-watching all those old TNA weekly pay-per-views. Oh, God. And, and about the time that Russo took over as the head writer, like halfway through the first year, the Harris Twins were all over every fucking show. And if you think the Harris Twins are bad in one segment... Imagine them on six or seven segments on the show with Disco Inferno as the head heel for a few weeks. <laughs> I don't know which Harris twin it was because, again, they're identical twins. But one of them, I don't know if they were injured. I don't know what was wrong. It, perhaps they were injured. Perhaps there's something wrong. However, one of them were taking the absolute worst bumps you've ever seen and either couldn't or just wouldn't sell, and he was the one that was in the ring the longest. Right, so, but, let's get to the The less said about this match, the better. This was the start of the LOD 2000 drug pusher, pilled up Hawk angle, which apparently he was fine with. I guess he was just happy to still be getting a paycheck. They fired Sonny like the, the day or the week before, because they only needed one pilled up cokehead on the team. And when Sonny left, that's also my interest in LOD 2000 left. By the way, Dave's report, because I want to quote him on this one, um, he said, let's see, they really tried, but they just don't work well together, but this was worlds better than their house show matches. So I can believe how, that. How bad were those house show matches? 
So the big turning point in this match is, uh, you know, Hawk takes his patented running shoulder bump into the ring post and collapses into the floor. Uh, we get uh, Hawk as the babyface in peril. Animal gets the hot tag. Animal kind of was the only one that was holding this match together. He actually, he actually hit a pretty impressive looking drop kick about, you know, close to the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, they take one of the twins to the corner. They take, uh, a very sloppy looking doomsday for a near fall. Paul Ellering had recently abandoned Legion of Doom to go with DOA, and he had named himself Mr. Dot Com because you know this internet thing it, it it's going to catch on. So Thanks. he he was at the ground floor when this whole internet interweb Netflix net web thing happened. <laughs> Thanks to Al Gore discovering the internet. Uh, Ellering distracts the ref while Hawk is down. The twins do a switch. Animal takes another DDT. This is like the third match in a row where the veterans are putting over these young guys, and he moves, and he loses to a transition move. Mm-hmm. One quarter star. One that was used multiple times in the show so far. My favorite spot of the match, though, I don't know if you noticed this, when DOA came out on their motorcycles, the production crew took the ring steps and placed them sideways against the guardrail. Now, there are guardrails along four sides of the ring. There are plenty of wide open guardrail space that you could throw each other into and it looked great on TV. And instead, one of the Harris twins threw Hawk into the part of the guardrail that had the steps leaned over sideways on. So Hawk had to gingerly lean into the steps that were in front of the guardrail. And so even in his coked up state, he could navigate that. So he's a professional. He is professional. <laughs> oh, man. I made the recommendation for Granny to watch Volkov and Sheik versus the Bushwhackers. I saw that. I, <laughs> I didn't know you hated Granny so much. <laughs> Uh, we get Vinnie Mac coming out with the Stooges. They head to the ring. Oh, yeah. Did we mention DOA one? Uh, yeah. That, doesn't matter. Uh, by, the, by the way, I would complain about all these promos there on pay per view, but if we didn't have all these promos, the Harris Brothers may have gotten more time. Yeah, thank God that they, you know, as they're timing this show out, so wait a minute, this match got more time than X Pac and D'Lo. Yep. Because, damn it, they're big. They're big men. We gotta, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I mark out at times for really big people fighting each other. Like the great Kali versus Kane. I love that. <laughs> Mabel versus Yokozuna. I'll watch that 15 times. Like this, though, the six foot five inch Harris twins and the LOD, who are not nearly as tall as you think they are. No, just not uh, not entertaining enough. I gotta send you a link. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a match on an indie show with the unlikely tag team of Vader and Scott Steiner against these two skinny jobbers, and it was that was a thing of beauty. Is that team any more crazy than Scott Steiner and Eli Drake as the Impact Wrestling World Tag Team Champions a few months ago. In 2018, uh, 162-year-old Scott Steiner is a champion. Yes, of one of the top companies in the United States. God, five years ago, if you would, if you would have said, I know we're digressing, people, but bear with us here. We're just amazed at the fact that in 2018, Impact is a successful indie group. I don't know what happened, but. I mean, I do, but it's still, it's just crazy. Basically, Vince comes out saying, if Undertaker isn't going to be here, Austin will have a suitable replacement, the Brooklyn Brawler. And the Brawler comes out, and you've never seen a man so happy to be uh, to be chosen as a partner. Oh, yeah, he was marking out for himself. I was sad they didn't have a uh, Titantron video for him, though. Well, you know, th- this this was a last minute decision. The production team and the sound guy they they didn't ha- they haven't had time to make a a video or or music for the brawler. I mean, he's only been employed by the company for twenty five years. Of course. And now Vince also said, 
And this made complete sense, which made him an even bigger heel. That if The Undertaker no-shows the pay-per-view, it's not his fault. Steve Austin hit The Undertaker with a steel chair, not Vince. Steve Austin flipped The Undertaker off, not Vince, etc., etc. So if The Undertaker doesn't show up to be Steve Austin's partner, it's Steve Austin's fault, not Vince McMahon's. And if you look in your program, at the bottom, in very small print, it says, Card Subject to Change. And so, so Vince was well within his right to make that substitution. And Jerry Lawler agreed with him. He thought he could be a great partner for Steve Austin. They, they have so much in common. They're both brawlers. They like to drink beer. And then it just, that's where the similarities ended. Well, that, that whole card subject to change thing, um, came back to me at my first WF House show back in 1992. The main event was supposed to be Undertaker versus Kamala. Now, I wish they would have come up with some excuse as to why Kamala couldn't be there. I really wish they would have said something like his car broke down. Just for the sight of Kamala, the Ugandan giant, with a giant mask on and a spear, driving a car down the street. Calling Enterprise, asking, can I use my points to get a car rental? Yes. And breaking down. And so I got a main event. Now, I was eight years old, so to me, this is the greatest main event ever. It was The Undertaker in a two-on-one handicap match. And I bet if I give you a thousand guesses, you probably (laughs) won't guess his opponents in this match. Let's see, 2002 heels? No, 1992. Oh, oh, 1992 heels. Um, hmm. I will guess Papa Shango and the Berserker. Shockingly close. It was the Berserker and Mr. Fuji. Ah, you got a chance to see Fuji live. That's awesome. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, he did the job. Oh, of course he did, because you know you got to protect Berserker. Yes. Because they got plans for him. Oh yes. <laughs> he, uh, had to, he had to run his broadsword through somebody. I'm sure. Right. Uh, my first card subject to change was, I believe, '97. It was supposed to be. I believe it was supposed to be Taker and Austin, and they said that Austin couldn't, uh, he was unable to make it because of weather issues. This was in the summertime, so it's not like there was fucking snow on the ground here in Winnipeg. Are you sure? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and then, as it turns out, he just wasn't allowed to come into Canada, so. And we ended up getting Bret Hart and, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley as the main event, which ended up in a, in a DQ anyways. See, I was ready to think of all the people that could have replaced a, a quality replacement for Steve Austin in the main event against The Undertaker. I was going to go maybe Savio Vega, you know, Crush maybe. Repo Man? They could bring and, him back? I don't know, this know, was, this was, was think, 90, this was 98, but they could have still brought him back. I'm sure he wasn't doing anything. By, by the way, I am happy since you said that we're reviewing something from 20 years ago. You didn't decide, considering the air date, that we had to review Road Wild with Jay Leno. <laughs> I would not, I would have been really busy tonight and would not have been able to <laughs> help you out. Oh, I gotta, I gotta shave my cat. Yeah, I can't make it in. No, like, like I said, we're only on episode three. I don't want to scare people away that early. My Twitter feed is flooded with people doing independent podcasts. There's a billion of them out there. I want to make something that people actually want to listen to. I We're going to have get. One. I I know. We're going to get into some of the crappier shows, you know, later on. But you know, I got. I need to set the table before I clear it off. <laughs> before you run off the customers, you want to build them up a little bit. I understand. Oh, fuck, fuck! No one's listening to this, anyways. <laughs> Yeah, it, it turns out I was not the big guest you thought I was. Uh, <laughs> you you weren't the draw that you that, that they told you you were. No, no, no. Sadly, no. They Kevin failed. and Rhea, we're we're gonna make you a star. You're gonna be a you're gonna be the champion. We're gonna make dolls for you. Yeah, Vince. Uh, if uh, next we had the uh, the uh, dungeon match at the uh, Steve Hurts uh, place in his basement and. Uh, is his son Owen? He took an uh, Ken uh, Shamrock. You know Ken's uh, 
His sister Ryan's a whore. Hey, hey. I, I, I need the money to pay the house because I was mad that they still screwed Brett. Yeah. Maybe uh, one of uh, Brett's uh, sisters could uh, hit me up with that. She's, she can't because you know why? Because she's a whore. <laughs> You're going to get kicked out of Canada. You know that, right? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we have done... Got, oh, go ahead. I don't know my Canadian geographers. I don't know how close Manitoba is to Alberta, so I'll just assume it's still enough that they can still kick you out of Canada, you know, for mocking stew. Well, if you look down the highway out west, you can see Winnipeg from Calgary. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> see, all, all I know about Canada is there's Stew Hart, and there's Toronto, and then Corner Gas is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Corner Gas is in Dogger vs. Saskatchewan, baby. Yes, it is. So we have the dungeon match with the special referee, Dan the Beast Severn. And, uh, you know, we, we, we joke about this, but it, I did find it quite amazing that WWF and Stu agreed to do this, because th- we're only a year removed from the, from the Montreal screw job. Uh, they, they did this, uh, I'm pretty sure this was pre taped a couple of days before, and nothing looked less intimidating than Ken Shamrock. At the top of the staircase, <laughs> getting getting into the zone. Yes. Walking into <laughs> and, the kitchen. He's walking. He's in his fucking trunks. And he's walking through the kitchen with, with his gloves on. I'm sure Helen's at the table just doing a crossword puzzle and drinking tea. Don't hurt <laughs> anything, boys. Uh, he gets to the top of... Oh, God, I'm sweating here. So the top of the stairwell, and the camera shot is from the bottom looking up, and there's just like this dark silhouette shadow of Shamrock getting into the zone, and then he creeps down the stairs, step by gradual step, passing jackets that are hung up on the side of the, the, the wall, and I think there's some gardening tools there, and probably some old newspapers. Oh, God, you know that... He was thinking of those damn steps were going to collapse on him. <laughs> I'm enjoying this way more than I have any right to. <laughs> You're enjoying this, the 10 second walk down the steps much more than you probably enjoyed the 5 minute match. Uh, <sighs> Alright, i going to compose ourselves. We're professionals here. So they, they were legitimately in the dungeon. It's like a small, I don't know, maybe 10 foot by 10 foot raised platform. And it was a hard wooden floor with a thin tarp over it. So, yeah, of course we're doing 6,000 bumps because a hard wooden floor is the hardest part of the ring, you know. Yeah, they've got the, uh, the wood paneling on the side, which our guys got thrown into multiple times. Uh, we noticed that there are a lot of holes in the ceiling tiles because Shamrock had his head put through there. As for some, I'm going to say one shape like Ken Shamrock's head. Right. Uh, there's, you know, for no reason, there's just this giant exposed pipe. Shamrock took a bump on. He had to hit a leap in order to take a bump to the ribs. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a couple times, Shamrock was having his head smacked into the paneling by Owen. Owen stopped pushing his head, but Shamrock kept going. Did you notice that? Oh, yeah. You know, Ken is a professional. You're going to hit his head off the wall. He's, you know, going to hit his head off the damn wall. Uh, we had a referee bump in this match because why not I, I've seen every UFC match that Dan Severn was in he has taken kicks to the head before he did not go down but the force of Ken Shamrock's kick the muscularity of his legs caused this errant kick to knock Dan Severn asunder and that, he was dead that kick was more action than their UFC 9 fight uh, Shamrock, like an idiot, turns his back to check on Severn after he waffled him with a kick. Owen then grabs a dumbbell, which just happens to be like a whole wall of dumbbells, and he clonks him with it, and miraculously, at the same time, Severn just wakes up. He sees Severn tapping, but it's not Severn, or it's not Shamrock tapping, it's Owen pretending to tap 
Shamrock's arm. Severin sees this as a submission, despite the fact that Shamrock's eyes are closed, his tongue is sticking out, and a pile of drool is coming out, declaring and, Owen Hart the winner. And actually, Owen put him in the crippler crossface at first, and uh, then realized he couldn't have him in the crippler crossface, and used one hand to be tapping him out. They put him in, I don't know, he kind of looked like a Rings of Saturn, or the, the, the Regal Stretch. You know, one, one of those things where an arm is trapped and the head's pulled back. Something like that. So the, the the actual match only lasted four minutes and fifty four seconds, but the star of this segment is is the Ken Shamrock walk down the steps. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh Christ, yes. Now I'm gonna ask you a question before we get to the next match. Shoot. Did you look up or did you remember what ha- what the results were of all these matches before we watched them this time? Fuck no. Okay. So when Howard Finkel announced in this match and this match only that there was a 30-minute time limit, how I'd... quickly did it take you to realize <laughs> it was a 30-minute time limit draw? I knew you were going to go there, and the first thing, I didn't notice it until after the second fall, because there was no fucking timer. There's no clock. No one knew, except the announcers, apparently, how much time was in this match. They were foreshadowing. They oh, yeah. went in, they got into their time machine, they went forward 20 years to Dolph Ziggler and Seth Rollins' Iron Man match, and they saw what was going to happen if they had a clock on the wall, and they said, we don't need this, this that's too much hassle. So we're going to keep everybody in the dark, except for the announcers. It's like, I remembered... This was a 30-minute time limit because, again, I remember everything. And I really realized when watching this, it was the only match they announced a time limit for. Jim Ross went out of his way to say that due to television time constraints, they had a 30-minute time limit. But no other match, even though there were television time constraints for every match on the show, no other match had a time limit, or at least an announced time limit. No. Do we need to go through every spot in this one? Uh, think... no. Nope. Um, here's what Bas- you need to know. The, this, in, within 30 seconds, this was the best match on the show. And within about five minutes, the crowd, which had seen one screw job after another, one outside interference after another, realized that none of the falls were going to happen until there was outside interference. Yeah. Hold on for just one second. Holding on just one second that I'm doing. All right, I, edit editing because the wife came in to ask a question. Uh, you, we find it. You oh, didn't hear it? me singing, did you? I'm keeping that in. Okay, good. Uh, you did actually pick that up, but they hit me on mute. <laughs> See, there's a mute on my end, so if I just keep talking, I can mute self. Uh, I wrote. Try- I hope they can hear like you going in and out of audio over and over and over again. <laughs> or they'll just think I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> Episode 4 is not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so China is the only one who's allowed to stay at ringside outside of DX and the nation. because She has a manager's license. I wish like they had the California State Athletic Commission uh, licensing hearing available where China went and had to plead her case for a manager's license. Yeah, she needs she needs character references. She needs a uh, a professional. Um, uh, fuck, I don't know. I don't know what it takes. <laughs> I they make it up as they go along anyway. So uh, uh, I'm sure she gave him twenty five bucks, and they gave her a piece of paper that said manager's license on it, <laughs> written in crayon. Yes. I'll give you a VHS copy of Our Time if you give me this. This Ooh. license. Ooh, that sounds good. So the first fall didn't happen until 20 minutes and 24 seconds. It's, you know, at, at this point where we've had run-ins. We've had D'Lo come in. We've had the Outlaws come in. We've had the Godfather come in. We've had a belt shot. We've had um, multiple chin locks. We've had neck breaker is, um This was, I think, the oh. very first attempt at them trying to sort of like wet their toe in the semi-main event picture for these two guys. 
Yeah, but you're gonna you're gonna you're not gonna mention the best part of the first ball, are you? When four hundred pound Mark Henry tiptoed right. the ring side, he he snuck in. No one did notice the four hundred pound <laughs> black man sneaking to ringside, and he splashed Triple H on the ground outside. I, I was hoping that in the background they would put a soundtrack. Da, 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 da. <laughs> As he's as he's tiptoeing ever so slightly into the ring. Oh, and actually I'm wrong. That's not even the best spot. Well, if it's not tied for number one, the best spot is, for some reason, trademark, The Rock began arguing with the referee and began showing off his bicep several times. For some reason, like, what the hell is he doing? Just pointing at his arm over and over again. Hey. Hey, Kyoto, check this out. Oh, oh, I wow, got me, Rock. I got me some guns. Wow, Rock, that's really nice. Don't you think you should try to win the match? Oh, hey, what's that noise? Oh, don't worry about that. That's just, Hunter probably fell down or something. <laughs> it's not Dilo trying to interfere or anything. He's he's clumsy. Yeah. It's not like he's going to amount to anything. I thought it was weird seeing Triple H. Well, first of all, he was still uh, introduced as Hunter Hearst Helmsley, mm-hmm. and he was still wearing long trunks. I remember it was so weird when he started wearing short tights. It's like, and now it's like it's weird going back, especially when he's wearing those riding pants that he used to wear when he was the Grinch snob. Right. And he then clear, he clearly figured out that you can't skip leg day. Yeah. And then they were saying that he uh, he was the smaller man carrying the rock. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> That's foreshadow here. That's. So the start of the second fall, so, so Rock's up one nothing. Oh, yeah, that was uh, important, too. The Rock hit him with the Rock bottom and pinned him in the first fall. Yeah, I, I, I suppose we should mention who got uh, who who uh, who got the advantage. I'm and, pretty sure if we just told you the Rock was the heel, Triple H was the baby face, and it went three falls, you probably could have guessed it. But, hey, it's best for you to know as well. And unlike Michael Cole, Jim Ross did not turn to his partner and say, now that he's won the first fall, do you think he has an advantage? Hmm, I don't know. Fuck you, Michael Cole. Uh, see, I hate uh, Corey Graves so much more than any other announcer. So, it's like, I can almost ignore Michael Cole. Except that time Coach said that when Nia Jax was squeezing Ronda Rousey, if Ronda oh, was God. catching her breath. <laughs> he spent too much time at ESPN. Oh, God. Or maybe not enough. All right, so uh, Rock delivers, so we're in the middle of the second fall, Rock delivers the people's elbow, which at this point it's more of an insult than a finisher. He gets a two, Triple H climbs up and he gets hit with the, Euro- no, how, someone got hit with the European belt, because D'Lo had, D'Lo was previously knocked out, but he sprung back to life. I think that was in the first fall, uh, well, Rock hit him with the IC title belt, which Hunter kicked out of. Uh, China Storm's in... She yanks D'Lo off of the guardrail. Uh, the ref heads out to put a stop to those shenanigans. And then X-Pac sneaks in, delivers the X-Factor to The Rock. Now, it's important to know because X-Pac beat The Rock with that very same move only two weeks ago on Raw. Mm-hmm. But this was not enough to hunt or to get a win here. Nope. China come, uh, Rock levels Triple H with a clothesline. Looks to whack him with a chair. China stops him with a low blow. China gives Rock a DDT, another one. The agents are not communicating with each other. No, they are not. And this they, is where the Rock had accidentally hit the referee with the chair. Oh, yeah, man, Keogh was a champ for taking that shot. Yes. That looked vicious. So he gets cover, uh, Triple H covers him for, th- for the second fall after Rock gets DDT on the chair. We're now at 26 minutes and 36 seconds. I'm automatically thinking, Oh well, someone's uh, they're gonna they're gonna go to overtime because you can't have a time limit draw. You always have overtime. But you don't understand that they had time constraints on this show. But this we've match been, could only have a time limit. But we've been preordained to know that you never have time limit draws. You always have overtime. Uh, so now we're in the third fall. There's a one minute rest period in between, so we're, we're already eating up some time here. Once the bell sounds, 
uh, referee Earl runs down to take uh, Mike Kyoto's place because he is now being helped to the back. Uh, Hebner has to run the length of a football field to count a near fall, which Rock kicks out of. Triple H sends Rock into the guardrail. Rock catches Trips with a desperation Samoan drop for a near fall. Ross tells us that we have one minute left, and the crowd is still completely unaware of this. Maybe it was because the crowd was dead because they didn't know, but like it did not seem exciting at all these last two minutes. Like They weren't going for their big moves. They kept going for their setup moves, moves that never win matches. And so by the time Hunter hits his pedigree, the match is over. And But it's like... Yeah. But at least, can't we have the Fink saying, there are five minutes remaining, three minutes remaining? We didn't even get that. So, of course the crowd's not going to be into this. Well, it's probably... I mean, it's, it's hard to argue because if they would have done that, they really would have been telegraphing the 30-minute time limit draw ahead of time because they don't do it. They've never done it. Like, at least when WCW used to have the TV time TV title time limit, that was always the only match that they would announce time limits for. So even if the match didn't go the time limit, you knew that in the TV title matches, they would make time calls. WWF never did time calls. And this, I think, it would have been more obvious if they had all of a sudden. I guess it probably would have telegraphed it a little bit early. So this ends in a 30-minute draw. Uh, sorry, Hunter, you don't win the IC title. Um, there's no sudden death over time in 98. We don't have our own network yet, so we can't do five-hour shows. Thank God. I, you know, there was no way for Rock and Triple H to go 30 minutes without, without exposing a lot of weaknesses. And so I think they, over, they overbooked the crap out of this with all the run-ins and all the ringside brawling. And, but like I said, at the same time, I thought it was a nice start to their sort of semi-main event push because these two would have what I thought was a, would be a really good ladder match at SummerSlam the next month. And by the end of the year, Rock was WWE champion. See, I always thought the latter match between those two were good, but I always thought it was also overrated. Like, I never was as in love with it as everyone else seemed to be. Well, if, if you look at what was on the rest of that show, maybe it, it just it, it just stuck out because nothing else did. So you're telling me the oddities versus Kai and Tai... Did not get many positive stars from Dave. I'm telling you that Edge and Sable versus Mark Merrow and Jacqueline was not as good as the latter match. If huh. you can believe that. I, I mean, I don't know. Is that, I, I think you might be pulling my leg here. We're going to have to check the star ratings for that one. So we get Kevin Kelly and Tom Pritchard in the back. They've confirmed that The Undertaker has arrived, which completely negated the two previous segments, because, of course, he's going to show up. Uh, we get Justin Reynolds By the coming way, out. the person most disappointed by The Undertaker showing up, perhaps only person disappointed, Brooklyn Brawler. Brooklyn Brawler had the chance to get beat up by Kane and Mankind on na- nationwide pay-per-view, and that was taken away from him. And you know that he approached Taker in the locker room and said, Hey, listen, fucker, you yeah. stole my spot. You know, and Taker was like, I'm sorry, Mr. Lombardi. You know, he probably went and sat next to Dennis Stamp because they could understand what it's like <laughs> to not get booked in the main event. Yeah, just see a brawler bouncing up and down on a little trampoline carrying three-pound weights. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin Reynolds comes out. Not Gold Dust, not Dustin Rhodes, but Dustin Reynolds comes out. And this was a start of his, I guess, religious gimmick, said that the Messiah is coming very soon. As soon as I saw this, like, I completely wiped this angle from my memory banks, because this this just reeks of Russo. And Mm -hmm. anytime you start to do a religious gimmick, you're going to automatically segregate a certain percentage of your fan base. He led the crowd in prayer, and... You know, at the end of the day, he spent like two months building up that the Messiah is coming, and the Messiah was just gold dust coming back. With Luna. No, no, this was long after Luna. This, well, it wasn't right oh. away, but this led to Blue Meanie. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. I got my time frame mixed up, because that was the previous Rumble. Yep. 
He, okay. He dumped uh, Marlena for Luna, and I mean, I'm sure Luna was a lovely person, but unless you're Gangrel, not a whole lot of people were dumping Terry Runnels for Luna Vachon. You know what? It takes all kinds. There you go. Speaking of ladies, uh, we have basically what this entire pay-per-view was building towards. It's what all of the advertising was pushed towards. The bikini contest with Sable and Jacqueline. We've all seen the pictures. I wrote Sable won. No, she didn't. (laughs) That was the extent of my report on this. But she didn't win. It was a dusty finish. <laughs> and I don't know. And, we should we should ask Brock if. No, never mind. But <laughs> if it's it, dusty, it, it, I, I'm I'm gonna go to hell for this one. <laughs> Who had a bigger bosom, Sable, Jackie, or Dusty Rhodes? I'm gonna go out on a limb and say Jackie. I don't know. <laughs> I <laughs> between oh. the two ladies. I did think Jackie was in better shape, but the company's not going to hitch their wagon to Jackie, who uh, who did actually give us more than Sable did. Well, she had the quote-unquote accidental nip slip, which, you know, she... It was not an accident. Um, by the way, the build-up they- build to this match saw Jackie call Sable a skank, and Sable accused Jackie of being a prostitute, and then Mark Merrill couldn't keep his penis erect. That was the build-up to this bikini match. Can you imagine this in 2018? Um, I don't know what the PG version of Skank, and, you know, they probably got pretty PG when they're talking about how Mark Merrill's penis couldn't become erect, because they came up with every euphemism to say that without actually saying that. So I'm going to spend zero more seconds on this. Sable won. Let's move on. Unle- unle- she, unless there's any, unless there's anything you want to add. But she didn't win. She was, she lost via disqualification because the next night on Raw, I swear to God, I'm not <laughs> making this up. They announced that because body paint is not a bikini, Sable was disqualified. Why do you care this much? I want people to know the facts. You are a uh, broadcast journalist. You and are getting the scoops. You're going to really hate me because I'm going to tell you in a few minutes why this match, not the tag team title main event, why this match was the true draw of the show, and I have numbers to back me up. Oh, of course it was. You just, like I said, you just you Google fully loaded 1998, and 99 pictures out of 100 is going to be Sable standing there with with. Those with the prints on her tits. And the hundredth picture is the poster of the show, which is Triple H pushing his crotch at the camera. Yeah. God, 98 was great. <laughs> so, Kane and Mankind wrestled Steve Austin and The Undertaker in Ice... I'm sure there's a lot of people going, oh my god, what a marquee main event. Like, what the hell is already talking about? This must have been a great match. This match sucks. Mankind... <laughs> is a month after being killed in Hell in a Cell. He couldn't do much. Undertaker was still hurt, so he wasn't doing much. Kane, while he was a great gimmick, he hadn't yet figured out how to really work a good match as Kane, and so he sucked. Austin tried to carry all three of them, and um, led to a match that was better than the Dennis Rodman match. Low bar. Come know. on, get it, get out of here. I, I, I mean, I don't want to besmirch the good name of Dennis Rodman, but this match was a little bit better than that. Austin comes out wearing what appeared to be a volleyball knee pad on his elbow, and I was, what the hell is that? And then I realized right before King of the Ring last month, he had like a nearly fatal staph infection. Oh yeah. So, so he's so he's wearing this gigantic, you know, high school girls volleyball knee pad <laughs> on his elbow. Uh, match starts with like during Austin's entrance, Taker comes out and confronts him because it had been signed a couple weeks ago that Taker and Austin were going to main event SummerSlam, but 
somewhere down the road, down the highway to hell, they're going to throw a glitch in this because they're going to challenge for the tag titles for some unknown reason. And it wasn't, like, even, wasn't even supposed to be a tag title match. It was just to be a straight tag match. But then they put the tag belts on Kane and Mankind for some reason, and here we are. If I'm Stone Cold Steve Austin, if I'm the world champion, if I'm making millions of dollars, if I'm the highest grossing merchandise seller, I don't give a fuck about the tag titles. Why do I care? Kane, by the way, since King of the Ring, at King of the Ring he won the WWF title. The next night he lost the WWF title. Two weeks later he won the tag team titles. And here, 13 days later, he lost the tag team titles. And just to stay with that pattern, spoiler alert, two weeks after this show, Kane and Mankind won the tag titles back again. Just to lose them again two weeks after that. We gotta keep, we gotta keep the titles busy. We gotta, it's, it's exciting. People don't want long title reigns, yo. Bro. Bro. I will disagree with you on one point. Despite the fact that Foley was just a beat up wreck, I thought he, he took some, some, still some pretty vicious bumps. He took that wicked rib shot. From the apron, he was going for the cactus clothesline on Taker on the floor. Austin comes rushing in, pushes him off the apron. He lands rib first on the announce desk. Table doesn't break, but I'm sure one of Foley's ribs did. Oh yeah. And then, te- and then ten, se- ten seconds later, Taker gives him a backdrop on the floor. Mm-hmm. Like if this was any normal man, I would have been dead for a year before coming back and doing anything athletic. But Foley's the fucking man. And unfortunately, the crowd, when Steve Austin was not in this match, the crowd did not give a fuck. And it just made, like, the match, I think, only went, like, 16 minutes. But it just dragged for a while. And, you know, Austin had plenty of great pay-per-view main events in 1998. This was not one of them. So Austin gets a hot tag, and to me... In 98, there was nothing more exciting than seeing Austin hot tag, just because he just goes apeshit crazy. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he cracks Kane square in the face with an unprotected chair shot. Uh, mask or no mask, that looks like it, it sucked. Uh, that only gets a two. This leads to a chin lock by, <laughs> by mankind. So after this, after him running wild, stomping a mud hole, he gets a chin lock put on him. So Taker's on the apron. He's looking bored out of his mind in the corner. And the announcers assume that he doesn't want to tag in because he wants, obviously he wants Austin to be weakened for their SummerSlam match in a month. So there, uh, Austin gets hit with a choke slam. Mankind calls for the tombstone. Austin slips out and drops Kane with the stunner. Oh my God! He hit him with the stunner. He's going to go for the pin, but Mankind comes in and hits the mandible claw. Austin hits a stunner on him too. Michael so Cole, good. Michael Cole had been screaming that he did this out of instinct. <laughs> vintage. That was vintage Stone Cold right there. So everyone's down except Taker. Taker's, you know, if he was wearing a watch, he'd be like checking to see what time his laundry was done. Mm-hmm. He's c- completely disinterested. Austin starts to crawl. Taker's giving him the alligator arms, not wanting to tag in. This gives a chorus of boost from the fans and. My God, Taker's a baby face. He can't be booed. So he hulks up, and he extends his arm in a dramatic fashion, and he gets the tag. He hits choke slams on both guys, and then a single tombstone on Kane, and covers him for the three, and by God, we have new tag team champions. It doesn't matter, because they would lose two weeks later. But it was the first ever tag team title win for The Undertaker. Is it? Yes. I thought, oh no, Big Show came in later, right? Yep. Yeah. He then, Big Show, he teamed with Kane a couple times, and I think that's it. Ryan and I were trying to, Ryan and I were trying to figure out last, last episode how many tag partners that Kane has had with winning titles, and I think the over-under is six. Oh, uh, well, let's see. At X-Pac, Mankind, Undertaker. Rob Her- Van Dam. Rob Van Dam, Hurricane. Was did he win one with Spike Dudley? No. Um, we said Big Show. Daniel Bryan, uh, that's seven. Right. So we're already over. And I think that's it. Well, he's got his collection of gold. I was 
I don't know who Kane was running against in this mayoral election, but I can imagine if they were going to get creative, the type of uh, the type of uh, of uh, ads they could go against Glenn. <laughs> Just see him like, do you want this to be your mayor? And then just have like a highlight reel of him choke slamming people to to hell. See, I thought they were going to show, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Triple H dressed as Kane, uh, raping Katie Vick. You could do that. And, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're almost done and here, folks. I've we're, got, we're losing power. I've got some breaking news. You know, breaking news is recording this, but I don't know when Scoop. it's going to air. Yes. Glenn Jacobs, Kane, has officially been elected mayor of Knox County, Tennessee. Woohoo! Yes. USA. <laughs> you can, you might be able to hear his victory speech on the USA network. I'm hoping he comes in, does the fire gimmick. Oh, I can't imagine why he wouldn't. They need to have ring posts set up on either side of his little podium so he can give his acceptance speech. Well, I imagine that when he does city council meetings, anybody that doesn't agree with him, he's going to summon a lightning bolt from the ceiling and strike them down. I can, I, I, I imagine that as he's giving um, a public address, he has his little voice box gimmick thing <laughs> pressed up against his neck. And who could say no to him? So, before we go, i got to tell you why Sable, at least first three, four, five months was the biggest pay-per-view draw in the company. At least, Unintended. Yes. At, at least on a B-show level. Because this isn't counting Royal Rumble, Survivor Series, SummerSlam, and WrestleMania. Fully loaded with a bikini contest underneath a nothing tag match. Uh, did 329,000 buys which beat not only every In Your House, but King of the Ring, which famously had Undertaker kill mankind on top of the Hell in a Cell the month before. If you need oh, more, no. yeah, if you need more proof, back in April, they did the Sable Luna evening gown match, which the whole build was watch Sable get nude, and that did 309,000 buys, and a month later, with Sable in no real match, but a rematch with Steve Austin and Dude Love. In fact, the famous Steve Austin Dude Love match, that only did 211,000 buys. So it's no surprise that she was a draw. I mean, as a horny 13 year old at the time, without internet, by the way, I could definitely see why. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is fully loaded 1998. After the match, Taker leaves with both belts. So needless to say, Austin is kind of confused. Isn't that really the underlying attitude of tag team wrestling in the late 90s, though? Um, mm-hmm. All the draws are the single wrestlers, and we always we get the tag teams that don't get along. For This 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 show was kind of like a, a, a commercial for SummerSlam next month. A $30 commercial. Yeah. So... Uh, before we go, why don't you get some, uh, is there anything you want to plug on you know, Twitter? Uh, do you do that? What do you, what do you got I, going on? I am on the Twitter machine. You can follow me if you want at the really real AW and you'll notice there's just enough wrestling stuff to piss off my trans friends and just enough trans stuff to piss off my wrestling <laughs> friends. And hey, 325 people or whatever I'm currently at can't be wrong. This nice is your best, this is a page to follow. <laughs> You're an equal opportunity pisser offer. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, usually what we've uh, we've done the last two episodes is we have given what is called the Angry Marks Rewind Medal of Honor, much like the Fail Army Medal of Honor, to the MVP of this show. And after some long thought, uh, I guess based on what you've just said, your argument, I can't help but present this week's uh, trophy to none other than Sable. She is the MVP of this show. See, what I was, say, what I, say you? I was going to award it to Ken Shamrock just for him raging at the top of the stairs. You know, you might be right. I may have to take that back. S- sorry, Sable, you, you only get honorable mention. Uh, honorable mention, by the way, 
also goes to Vince Russo for somehow cramming like 50 people onto this show. So next week, um, I'm under, I'm of the understanding that Ryan will be back. And episode four, we put up a poll on Twitter asking which WCW uncensored event we want to get into. I thought we've done oh, a couple. Jesus we, we've, we've done some pretty good shows, some sort of middle of the road shows. I want to do a crap show. I want to punish myself because I hate myself and I want to watch something that's so terrible. The Twitter vote got a total of one vote. Oh, is it from 1996? It is not. It's for 1997. Oh, that was actually half decent. 1997, WCW Uncensored, which has a main event, is the Triangle Elimination Match with Team NWO versus Team WCW versus Team Roddy Piper. See, I mean, the main event was kind of screwy, but I mean, the undercard, you had Ultimo Dragon versus Psychosis. Um, you had Rey Mysterio wrestling. I you had Mal- Malenko and Eddie Guerrero in the opener. Yeah, it's like, damn, you got lucky. I was going to give oh. you 96, which had the Gangsta and the Ultimate Solution in the triple I, H match. <laughs> I, asked, I asked Ryan if he had previously seen that. That was going to be my first choice. But he, he said he's already seen it. I said, okay, well, maybe we can save that for another time. Let's watch something that I have never seen before. Or, or 95, which had... Um, the pickup truck match with the hay bales. Oh, not only that, it was Randy Savage versus Avalanche. And this show, by the way, that WCW built uncensored as, like, an unsanctioned anything-goes show, and it ended in a disqualification, spoiler alert, when Ric Flair ran out wearing a dress to beat up Randy Savage. I'm, I, I think that this was... They were trying to... Uh, counter ECW and their hardcore, uncensored type style. So uh, it wasn't for a couple of years, and then it just became a regular show. We're going to have Buff Bagwell and Scotty Riggs in a strap match. We're going to have Glacier versus Mortis. By We're going to have Prince Iakea on this show. I can't wait. I was, and I'm, and I'm not ashamed to say this, I was the one person who liked that Glacier-Mortis angle. I know I'm the one. Because you were a mark for Mortal Kombat. I had Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3 on the Sega Genesis, and why the hell not? I even marked out for Brian Clark coming out as Rat. Adam Bomb. Yes. (laughs) All right. James Vanderberg, before he blew off his hand. (laughs) Before he became a karaoke monster. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes episode three of Angry Marks Rewind. Thanks again to Aria Whitner for stepping in. For Ryan Joseph, this is Rowan Unra saying good night. Peace. Adios. You are listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network.